Hello, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on manual handling, equipment and funding. And this is the first in our series of occupational therapy webinars. I'm Ruth from the Huntington's Disease Association, and I will hand over to our guest speakers, Alex and Kirsty, to introduce themselves. And then we will run through questions which have been provided to us in advance from attendees of the webinar. So over to you, Alex and Kirsty. Hi, I'm Alex Fisher. I'm an occupational therapist um, in the West Midlands Regional Huntington's Disease Service. And I am Kirsty Page, occupational therapist working in a specialist hospital environment. And I've also worked in care home environments as well for people with Huntington's disease. Thank you both. OK, so our first um, question is what precautionary measures do we need to take when assessing clients with Huntington's disease? Okay, so um, this is quite a small question, but it's also quite a big question. So we just thought that the best way to answer it was to put it on screen so that people could follow it a little bit easier. And I've titled it Considerations for Therapeutic Input, because it sounds like it might be a therapist that's asking this question. Right in the center there is the person with Huntington's disease. And round the edges are the factors that I and my colleagues would consider really, really important. Then we have, um, you can see there, there's a bubble called environment just on the outside there of the person. And that's where they're situated. So are they situated in the community or are they situated in a residence such as a nursing home, i.e. the sort of areas that Kirsty works? Um, and that will give rise to the resources that you have, which are incredibly important. Um, that is the who is doing what to whom, um, what uh, resource do you have? What funding do you have, which is something that we're going to talk about later on, which is so important. What knowledge do you have? So what knowledge of Huntington's disease do you have? What knowledge of manual handling legislation do you have and how does it affect you? And then what time do you have? During the course of these webinars, we'll be talking about time as a really, really important factor. Things can often not be things shouldn't be rushed but sometimes due to risk they might need to be moved forward a lot more quickly then this really important bubble at the bottom here is um, the needs of families companions and carers so whilst we are working with the person with Huntington's disease we have to consider that all of these things are embedded into some kind of environment and usually that might be the person living with the person with Huntington's disease. So we need to take their skills and their health into account, their resources, their emotional lives into account. So um, let's move back to the center where we've got the person and we're actually going to look at HD factors here. So HD factors are what stage of the illness is the person at? Um, so sorry, Kirst, we need to go back a little oh, bit. I'm so sorry. Don't worry, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> um, and this is a really important because it helps us consider whether a rehabilitation approach is feasible or we need to take a compensatory approach. So rehab being, can we return that person to their function, their fullest function before their skills started to deteriorate due to a health condition or do we need to take a more compensatory approach in other words a maintenance approach for their skills um, so it's really important to have this knowledge about the person with hd then we're looking at risk factors below there it's about what's the priority and earlier on you heard me speak about time Often or not, sometimes you find yourself as a therapist or a carer in a really, really tricky situation and you want to actually deal with everything, but you really have to decide what's the priority, what's the optimal spread that I need right here, right now, and can it be done and how can it be done? Um, we need to take into account 
the risks that are presented to us by Huntington's disease, the risk to the person, the risk to others, and the risk of neglect. Um, we need to take into account things as, such as suicidal ideation, for example. All of those kinds of things come into our clinical reasoning. And finally, and Kirsty um, was really important in me putting this on this slide, was that risk assessment for manual handling must be dynamic. Um, one of the key things in Huntington's disease is that things change and they change really quickly. And one day you will have a person who's engaging and the next day they might not be. And that is pretty typical of their condition. So it's about being flexible and it's being about being dynamic and it's about revisiting. So it's a not a one size fits all. And I'm sorry for people listening to that because often we like, don't we, as individuals to kind of know what we're dealing with. But it's about having our HD radar on and making sure that our risk assessment can respond to situations as they change. And then the other thing which I've just starred here um, and I think is really important is sometimes when you're looking at a person with HD, you've got to take into account life events. These can have a remarkable and clinical significance on your practice and will do. So I was just thinking about a gent who was quite happily living in the community for a very, very long time. The risks were building up, but they weren't what I would say were hugely life altering. But then he used to attend a day centre and he had some chums there who had Huntington's disease. And within a space of about six months, all of his chums with HD died. And it was that, if you like, that huge life event, that huge, um, massive um, event, events of grief, life altering events had a clinical significance. And that was the bit that sort of tipped the balance with regards to his manual handling and then where he lived. So all of these things are really, really important. I'm going to say what I've always wanted to say. Next slide, please, Kirst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what does this actually look like then as a therapist, as anyone working with Huntington's disease? So in the early stages, chances are that the individual is able to take on board um, what you're working with them for. So there's still the internalised ability to be able to adapt and there's probably still the motivation to be able to change. And that's really important because apathy kicks in pretty early in Huntington's disease. So you might find that actually you are setting goals and actually they're not occurring and they might be occurring because of executive dysfunction, because it does happen early in the disease, as does apathy. But you, you have a good chance early on in the disease to make really, really good gains and to take advantage of what um, the boffins call cognitive reserve. So in other words, the brain is still functioning really, really well and is able to make changes. But then as we move into the mid stage of the illness, as therapists, anyone working with Huntington's disease, we're looking at a more maintenance based approach. Um, still some rehab, but it's more compensatory strategies. And then in the later stages of the illness, and I'm talking about a more palliative approach. And this is a quality of life based approach. People hear the term palliative, they get a bit scared. They think it's end of life. It's absolutely not. It's an approach that focuses on quality of life and living with an illness. So it's very much quality of life, palliative and, and right throughout this should always be person centered driven goals, if at all possible. Okie dokie. So the next question we had um, was, my patient refuses to shower. Do you have any equipment that you can suggest that will support him with his personal care? Now, this question, uh, though it asks about equipment, um, will also be about the person's cognition, their sensory needs, their... Um, behavioural needs such as apathy, the, the approach that's used, cog you know, communication, cognition. Um, but we're going to focus on the actual equipment side. Um, but also before we start talking about equipment, I just want to say this 
this area of engaging um, in showering can be really difficult. Um, certainly, in care and hospital environments where they've come in because their personal care is poor and it's become self-neglect and we don't necessarily have an instant answer um, and equipment is really important to consider but I also want to say that equipment doesn't necessarily um, give the answer it's part of looking at the person and all the factors surrounding why the person isn't showering. But saying that, we are going to focus on equipment and the physical presentation. So what I would look at um, as um, this person's occupational therapist is an assessment of um, the person's needs and goals and also what the carer wants. Um, and I'm considering safety for the person and comfort, but also the risks and benefits of using equipment equipment can be really beneficial but using it can also um, bring risks as well so my first thoughts are patients refusing how are they getting to the shower are they walking are they were they walking independently and has this become more difficult now is it initiation and they need you know um, prompting and orientation to the shower um do they need you to come in with a, a, a shower chair with wheels on so that you they can visually see, you've got a visual cue of what's happening. Shower chair, okay, I'm showering. And then you take them to the shower, the shower room. I've put up lots of photos, I like pictures. Um, really obvious, but I've put up there um, a handrail. If someone was independently showering and they now need additional support, simple simply looking at the environment um would a handrail on the wall help but think about has a person got good grip are they able to hold on to that um rail or actually when i talked about risk is putting a rail in a shower environment where someone's got um gross career movements are they going to cause harm by hitting that um rail by accident um in terms of the type of equipment, most important thing I've put on there, understand the chair, chair, chair is, is it robust? Is it sturdy? Really important that it's well maintained. Shower chairs by default get wet. So they do need to be, you need to be careful, they don't become rusty. However, my experience and Alex's experience is equipment needs to be robust and sturdy. It might be because of someone's career movements or it could be their uncontrolled movements when they sit down. You know, equipment does take a lot of hardware. So check, consider that. Um, I've put on there a picture of a wall mounted shower chair. They can be really useful um, if someone needs a support again to maintain their posture if they're becoming fatigued. Um, but bear in mind, if someone has got career movements, do you need to put any additional padding? I have used this style of chair and successfully, and I had to um, have the chair removed. The situation I'm thinking about, the patient was um, had career movements of the head and they were banging the head on the wall behind. So actually they needed a, a chair that we could wheel in and not be against the wall. Okay, so next slide, we're looking at um, um, progression of, um, of equipment as they were the wheeled shower chair. So as I said, if maybe initiation, maybe your patients, the person, sorry, is refusing to shower. Maybe taking the shower chair to him, getting him to stand and transfer in his bedroom and then taking him to the shower is all that's needed. Again, make sure that's stable, make sure it's got four locking casters and they lock well, so the chair doesn't move. I would be looking at someone's posture in that chair. If someone is, an, is slipping, imagine we've got a, slopey, a slippery wet environment as well. If someone's slipping on that chair, we've got a high risk of falls in the shower area. So then I would start consider, okay, we do need a shower chair, but what type? And I've got a couple of photos there of different style, tilt in space chairs 
So if you look at the pictures, you go back to the wheeled shower chair, the seat base is exactly the same on all of those, but the tilt means that the chair is tilting in space. So that's gonna um, reduce someone slipping, slipping out. Tilting space will have head support. They should have a head support. If you're tilting someone, their head needs to be supported. You can get them with a molded seat. So they actually mold to the shape of a person. Um, and think about um, accessories. You know, what might you want to add on there? So you might want to add some padding, particularly if someone's got poor skin integrity, if there's any pressure areas that are breaking down. You don't want someone sitting even for a short amount of time on a hard shower chair. Padding can also offer comfort. The, pad, the seat pad I've put on there as a photograph, that's um, a gel pad, so that should be comfortable. And also protection. So there are companies that will provide um, covers to go on the hard parts of your chair. Positional supports on the lower picture there. Um, for someone who has got poor trunk, poor um, ability to keep their trunk in midline, something as simple as a support for the, doing the shower could help. Um, suggesting these, maybe the person doesn't want to shower because they're not comfortable or they're fearful, they're frightened that they're going to slip from the chair. Positioning aids and safety is really important that we consider safety. So, however, um, if we are going to use positioning aids such as chest harness or a pelvic belt we need to do that with our person's um, consent because that's actually restricting them if we start using a tilt and a belt we're restricting that person from moving if the person isn't able to um, give verbal consent or they haven't got the cognitive ability to understand then you need to make a decision in their, that person's best interest Good practice would to be involve professionals and family members. Um, and consider, consider entrapment as well. So there, the bottom, that's, that's a carve support. So that would stop someone's leg, foot from falling off and going behind the chair. Okay, so that is the question on showering. The next question that I'm going to follow. Oh, sorry. I would just like to point out that um, on the HDA website are the um, occupational therapy clinical tips. They are under the um, professional guides um, under the HDA for professionals, but they're for anyone to use. And Alex and I um, wrote those and we've written them in a way that we hope anyone can pick up and find useful. They're not meant to be only for occupational therapists, they're for anyone who's working with um, someone with, with Huntington's disease and just wants some tips advice. So we talk about routines, toileting, bathing, grooming teeth, so just promoting that I guess. Um, okay, our question, next question was um, about hoists and slings. So the question is, I'd be interested to know if specific slings are recommended for hoisting. Any advice with suitable sling and hoist for mid to late stage HD? Okay. So I wanted just to go through um, the manual handling assessment, depending on where you are, I don't know whether these questions were from someone in the community, someone living at home or a care home. But it's really important you know how to get the correct manual handling assessment and using hoists and slings comes into that. So um, if someone living at home, you need to be going to signpost to your local occupational therapist. Um, social services teams um, will be able to um, assess and advise on manual handling. That could be um, o OTs, it could be physiotherapists, and they will do training as well. Um, in a care home environment, staff should have training, will have training on manual handlings and how to assess for basic slings. Um, in specialist services, so I work in a specialist service and I'm a member of the team who is trained in manual handling but if I'm using um, if I'm working with someone who's got really um, specialist needs 
I would um, work with a company that I'm buying the sling from and I would ask to do a joint assessment. So when choosing a hoist and a sling, you need to consider your environment. So ceiling hoists are available and they can be used with one carer. The advantage of the, of the ceiling hoist is there's more, it gives you more space in the environment and it reduces the um, possibility of the person colliding with furniture and equipment. Um, a mobile heist, on the other hand, if you look at the following picture, you can see straight away when we talk about reducing colli colli collision collisions. I'm not going to get to say that word today. <laughs> um, you look at that person's feet and how close they are to the metal parts of the hoist. So that's a disadvantage of a mobile hoist. Um, and you need two carers for a mobile hoist. However, an advantage is you can use them anywhere. Um, when choosing a hoist, just consider, are you gonna, do you want to move a patient from the floor? And that's a question that we've got coming up. Some mo hoists go all the way to the floor, others don't. I would always recommend a, a hoist that goes to the floor and you're feature proofed if you need it later. Um, it goes without saying when you're assessing for this type of equipment, you're considering the person's um, physical presentation, their cognition and their behaviour. That's all part of um, our assessment when we're looking at equipment. Types of sling. Yes, there are certain slings I would consider for mid to late stage HD. Um, the first thing I've put up is probably the one I wouldn't, <laughs> but I just wanted to talk about it anyway. And that's a universal sling. And that's a sling that um, is used to move someone from bed to chair, chair to shower chair or to bath. Once the person's been moved, that sling is normally taken out from underneath the person and then put back in when they need to be moved again. Um, I've put how many slings. Um, Alex and I um, both agree quite strongly that there should be enough slings for the person. And we would say um, it should be no less than three slings so that you've got one in use, one in the wash, one ready to go. Um, the sling underneath is um, an in situ sling. And the difference between those slings is the type of material and an in situ in situ sling will have a breathable like a cool max material and there'll be less friction points within that so there's no seams so someone can sit in that sling and they won't be sitting on any rough or hard hard parts so that is really good for tissue fiability if someone has got any um concerns about tissue viability then you need an in-situ sling. The material is breathable. These slings can be left in place after hoisting. Thinking about the mid to late stage HD person, once they've sat in a chair it could be really hard to take the sling out and get back in again. So that's the point when I'd be looking at an in-situ sling. And these can only be put in place when someone is lying. So they get put on when the person is laying on the bed. And then the person gets moved into their chair. Generally, in situs aren't used in showers, but I've got a patient at the moment who we do use an in situ because that's the right sling for her. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't dry as quick, but we use it, it gets put in the dryer, gets washed and dried, and we use her spare sling. Okay, and this is a particular sling that I will consider for mid late stage HD, and it's called an extensor spasm sling or a um, balance sling. And it's quite difficult to see, but it's worth having a Google of these. What the two pictures I'm trying to demonstrate is that the top, um, the top loop of that sling is on a continuous loop. So if a person moves, has a career movement or an extensor movement, 
they move within the sling. So you can see that bottom picture, it's demonstrating that the person is able to move within. If I'm gonna use this type of sling, I like to do my assessment with the sling supplier. Um, <clears throat> I also would consider if I'm using this type of sling and someone's got career movements, what staffing numbers. So I've said if we're using a mobile hoist, I would have two carers, but actually I've care planned three or four, depending on the risks and the movements. Um, if you imagine someone's moving and we don't want them to hit anything in their environments, or you might need someone who is just purely doing the intervention of calming and reassuring and talking to the person. Really important when you're considering your slings that it, they are compatible to your hoist. So for example, different style of hoists have different um, style slings to go with them. It could be the loop system that you see there, or it could be a clip system. I'm going to go to next, which is, oh, I've jumped, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I think um, I think there's the on floor question now, isn't there? So oh, yes, thank you. No, it's all right. But I was just um, I was just about to mention the staffing numbers. I think it's really important. Yeah. I think people sort of get stuck with a mobile hoist has two care staff associated with it or two users associated with it but actually it is as many as you need um, and manual handling legislation allows for that and if that is part of your assessment then that's what should be provided i think it's really important to say that because i think people get stuck with numbers um, but it is really very much about the risk assessment and protecting that individual from harm um, it's also really yeah really important for quality of life here is that you know, countless times we've seen people just left in bed because they can't be moved and there's not the resources to move them. But there is always usually a solution. Mm -hmm. And even it, it might not actually be hoisting. It might be sideways transfers, for example, because Kirsty and I have discussed this before now. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing just to add um, on that note as well, um, Alex, is every time someone is moved and in whatever way hoisted a risk assessment is done your ot can come in and make recommendations and i've often said on a good day if you you, know, you need your staff members do risk, risk assessments on a good day you might need two staff on a on a day when there's more agitation it might be three or four I don't think that's particularly, <laughs> I think that could be frowned upon by your teams because when they're planning the day, but I can't predict how a person is going to be on that day. So it's really important that when you go to do your movements, you're doing your own risk assessment. We can only um, put in um, recommendations of two to three depending on that day it's you doing that assessment every time you move that person like you're doing same same principle as, as when you're doing your safety checks on the sling every time you go to use a sling you do your visual checks it's mm. exactly the same when you make that decision is it safe to move this person today at this point in time or do i need to come back in five ten fifteen minutes just because it's not safe to get someone up at that moment in time doesn't mean that they you can't in 20 minutes time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it's yeah, your question, Alex. Okay, so let me see. My question was, okay, I think it was about a person with Huntington's disease placing themselves on the floor and how do we get them up from the floor? And I suppose, when we were thinking about the answer to this, we wanted to say that this is really common. <laughs> so number one, this is really common, it's not unusual. We wanted to set it against the background of um, a person with Huntington's disease and why they're doing it. Because I've seen it written down that it's deliberate. Um, and in many respects, I suppose it is deliberate but it's not deliberate as in to cause a problem, as in to provoke a reaction. It's actually usually due to the fact that the person may be transitioning to immobility. 
And that's a really, really scary time for somebody with HD. Um, they are literally losing the ability to know the position of their joints in space. So, okay. So what we need to do right from the get go with people with HD and our physio colleagues would say this is actually we need to start thinking about this right from the very beginning, right from diagnosis, if a person will of course engage with that, is to work with physiotherapists to maintain mobility, to look at the fact that falls will happen how we can minimize the risks of falling, i.e. environmental assessment, but also how we can maintain strength and conditioning. So that's diet, et cetera, et cetera. But also if falls do happen, can we teach the individual to get up from the floor? So that's embedded right from the get go. Because remember early on in the illness, the person does have the ability to take on board this information and make those internal um, adaptions to their behavior. So if that hasn't happened, but if they are still able to uh, um, take on board um, how to get up off the floor, that should be encouraged. That should be them using their own skills with you prompting, maybe hand over hand, not lifting, not lifting their weight, but encouraging them to get up off the floor. Um, and there are loads of videos online about this very thing. There's an organization called Move It or Lose It. And there's a really nice video on there, which um, has a physio instructing an individual to get up off the floor. And you can break it right down. And again, our physio colleagues in their clinical tips, um, they encourage that to happen. Okay, so getting back to our person on the floor we think they're frightened we think they're losing the ability to understand the position of their joints in space but they still kind of know what's happening so in other words they have the capacity to understand their behavior so what we do is we make sure that once they've fallen have they injured themselves if they have injured themselves clearly we need to deal with that first but then if they haven't injured themselves, can we make them safe? Can we make others safe? Do we need to move them out of the way? So say they've fallen in front of the fire exit, for example, how do we move them out of the way safely? Which is often about slide sheets. So, um, and that can be done, no problem at all, because that involves reducing of shearing forces. And you're just getting them into a safe place until they're in the position to, be enabled to get back up off the floor. And that needs to be built into care plan. It's as simple as that. In the community, um, there are devices such as um, lifting devices, which aren't necessarily hoists, but are things such as um, the Mangar cushion range, uh, the Mangar camel, which has a back piece on it. And individuals with Huntington's disease, providing they have got good postural support, so good stability around their midriff can absolutely use those and they can be used by single carers to get people up off the floor. It's a really, really good piece of kit. Um, so now we're getting to the point where actually the person maybe doesn't understand the risks that they're placing themselves at by taking this potentially defensive behaviour. And so what we have to do is we have to um, create a strategy if they don't understand, which is in their best interest. So in other words, do we leave them on the floor or do we hoist them? Um, how many people do we need to hoist? Have we got the kit? Are they going to be agitated? Do we have the correct slings? All of those things that Kirsty has spoken about. Now, we get to the point sometimes whereby an individual seemingly wants to be on the floor and it might actually be the safest place for them. So in other words, they are so agitated or their career is so great and actually pharmacologically, it's not been able to be managed because um, the medication hasn't touched the career or hasn't touched the, the behavior. And so we need to consider, can 
should care take place on the floor? Which sounds really undignified and really scary, I know, but actually sometimes does need to happen. But of course, people don't just exist on the floor, do they? So actually we've got to consider risks such as how do we get them to eat and drink? So in a meeting called a best interest meeting, all of these things need to be discussed so that collectively um, a strategy, a dynamic strategy can be put in place. I think that's everything, unless you've got anything to add, Kirst. No, that's answer the question about the safest way to assist a patient that a person that tends to call around the floor. And I like how you finished that, Alex, because there might well be um, a safest way at that point in time, but that the person can change. And I've oh. certainly experienced that of we had a lady who had a really nice padded large space in her bedroom. And that's what she was choosing to do. But actually it became a risk for carer, carers and her because we couldn't get her in a good enough posture to have food and drink. And then every time we went to help her eat and drink, she was at risk of aspirating. Um, so that was a point of we had to think, OK, maybe crawling around the floor isn't right now for her. Um, and you, you've covered the movements and you've covered getting up from the floor. There's another product that I've seen. Um, it's called um, a razor and it's a bit like it's the same kind of product as the manga a portable way of getting someone off the floor. Um, but yes, you have. So we're going to go back now. Another <laughs> um, equipment, a piece of equipment, um, which I'm going to answer. And this is about seating. So once again, I'm just going to throw up again on the website is a lot more information. So do have a look under um, professional resources. And Alex and I have done tips for OTs, but hopefully useful for anyone um, when you're thinking about seating and posture. On there, we haven't talked about specific chairs, but in the presentation, we are going to talk about specific companies and chairs that we've we've independently used and we, we've liked these products. Um, so the question is, I would like to know more about identifying appropriate seating for someone with career movements. Okay, so straight away, someone's got career movements, it needs to be robust. Um, it needs to be a sturdy, stable chair. Um, some of these chairs, bear in mind, I've written on there four locking brake casters. Not all chairs automatically come with four brakes. And if you ask, you're buying from the right person who's able to work with you. I've to the, the chair at the top, the green one, that comes as two as a standard and I won't buy it unless the four, four casters are put on because I have seen the move if someone um, loses that ability to, they're still walking and mobilizing, but loses that ability to really um, um, flex at the hips and at the knees. You see people throwing themselves across their chair or into the chair and the chair moving. That's really frightening for staff um, and it must be frightening for the person as well. Um, and the type of fabric and durability when um, patients um, do become hot so actually some of the chairs they have a different style of fabric on the inside than the outside um, so the inside the black on all of these is um, a four-way fabric with a you know, stretch so it should be um, more comfortable for a patient um, padding think about padding think about where the padding needs to be um, on the arms, on the footrest. Sometimes footrests can be forgotten and they can be a footrest is really important to support someone's weight. But do you need a padded one? They can be padded. Um, or actually, is a footrest not the right for that person? You know, they're the things to consider. Um, if I'm doing a assessment, someone with a career movement, so I'm expecting to see them sliding in the seat it almost comes hand in hand with the career movements but again depending where the movements are but if someone's got pelvic and trunk movements 
and then the arms as well you're going to see that sliding um we talk about as occupational therapists we talk about sacral seating so people are sat right on the back of their bottom um and the movements can lead to skin damage so it's really important that we're aware of that um please um consider when you're looking at seating for someone with involuntary movements we are not necessarily going to stop the movements and we're not going to get someone sat perfectly in midline um but we might be able to reduce the movements we might be able to get the right chair to reduce and or we often say dampen down the movements so as occupational therapists we are considering the size of the chair is the chair the right size and actually quite simply if you get the right seat width and depth the movements can be reduced so the person is feeling supported and encased by the chair um, if the pelvis is supported and you might want to consider about that will reduce sliding and reduced um, pelvic rotation as well the seat angle can be considered the chair at the bottom there is called a um, Amiga chair and that has quite a deep seat angle so the person's hips are going to be lower than their knees and that helps to stop someone sliding and again can dampen the career movements. I always when I'm looking at seating start with securing someone's trunk I'm sorry pelvis if we can get the pelvis secure that's going to stop movements and then we can work up so I'm looking at trunk support lateral supports to stop someone leaning we can think about the shape of the back support again to offer more support does a person need headrest um support for limbs so support for hands and arms and support for feet as well i've i've used tables in the past but if you're thinking about using a table think about where the padding might need to be. It sounds a bit strange, but does the padding need to be on the underside of the table if someone is hitting the table from underneath? Um, and I've put on here about use of um, pelvic bouts, um, but you also you might want to need to consider a chest harness. You can get groin harnesses, which clip over the legs to help secure someone's um, pelvis and um you can get um, what are called lock and glide or we're going to talk about them in lock and glide sheets as well to go on a chair i've just listed some specialist chairs that um, i've used and i've put seating matters on there as well they do if you look on their website there's a really nice um film of um a lady with huntington's disease and her being assessed in her chair a rise recliner chair and then the, her being um, given a different style chair and you can see the difference it's lovely but what you can also see is she's still not sat perfect but actually she looks better than she did her movements have dampened and she's more likely to be able to engage in her environment so that's that's quite a nice little um little video it's going to go on to the next slide which is um slide sheets i'm not sure if we had um a a question about that i just felt they're really useful to talk about alex has talked about them in terms of using them on the floor if someone's on the floor crawling about and you need to move them to um hoist if you've got a fallen patient it's more likely your poor your patient has fallen in a position where you can't get a hoist to mm. <laughs> if something's going to go wrong it's going to properly go wrong it's going, to, it's going to always be behind the toilet or something like that yeah that's what that's the visual image that i've got as well mm -hmm. so slide sheets um to move that person to somewhere safe so then you can actually move them off the floor but they're also useful um for repositioning in bed um and can be used um for fitting a sling as well so the, to fit the sling behind a person behind person chair in the chair um, and I've also added on there a lock and glide sheet um, I've had varying success but it's certainly a good tool to know to have in your toolbox and that's a one-way sheet so you must go on the chair the right way but um, 
it will prevent the person moving forward out of the chair, but actually you can slide the person back. But a person does need to have upper body um, balance to be able to move them back. If someone can only lean against the back of a chair, you can't move them. They need to bring their body forward. But they're quite useful, um, useful items to know about. And we're going to hand over back to Alex um, to look at funding. Oh, crikey, have we got that far so far? Okay. I um, mm -hmm. don't, don't know why, I can only do one. Oh, there we go, it's all right. Oh yeah, we're there. Yeah, we've got it, we've got it. Let me just have a look at the question, okay? So, so the question, um, who funds what? Very yeah. confusing. Please, will you clarify whose responsibility it is to provide and purchase a chair or wheelchair if a person is living in a nursing home? Uh, so I'm just going to deal with funding as a whole because it's really confusing and uh, I've sort of broken it down as best I can. Um, Kirsty has put this on several slides. I actually had it on one slide at one point and it was just overwhelming. So first of all, depending on where you are, so let's go back to that original slide right at the very beginning. Don't move the slides, Kirst. I'm just no. trying to <laughs> make sure that people remember what I said, um, is where are you? So in the community in the UK following assessment from an occupational therapist it should have no cost attached to the assessment equipment should be funded through local authority or health okay smaller pieces of kit can be self-purchased now as occupational therapists we used to be able to prescribe pretty much everything but uh, budgets have been cut like they've been cut everywhere. So smaller pieces of kit can be purchased via self-purchase. And that's usually using your attendance allowance or personal independence payment monies, which I know is an issue in and of itself for people. Um, but again, get in touch with your friendly occupational therapist about this. Get yourself a functional assessment to go towards your application for these health benefits or via charity. So if not available through statutory services, um, then perhaps consider applying through a charity. However, charities are also strapped for cash. So there should be a really good argument here as to why this kit is not available through statutory services. Um, I'm certainly, um, I'm probably quite belligerent about this in that if this is due to a health condition statutory services or health should be paying and there should be a reason why they're not um, failing that and it's particularly if it's to do with housing adaptation it's through a um, process called disabled facilities grants and again your local occupational therapist usually local authority occupational therapist will guide you through this. They will do the assessment and then they pass over to housing and then housing tend to deal with it. OK, but it depends on your area. So there's different rules in different areas. So it's about getting to know who does what. Now, wheelchairs in the in the community. So if you're living in the community. Following an assessment and subject to local criteria, a wheelchair should be free to you providing you haven't chosen to upgrade. So in other words, you can take what is um, assessed for you or you can take the money in lieu of that, which means that you can add to it and you can upgrade. But please be careful on this front because if you upgrade, what tends to happen is that you can't access the maintenance that is free to you if you take the original option. Um, and that's really important because upgrades and maintenance of wheelchairs can be really, really expensive. OK, and again, criteria vary, um, but invariably wheelchairs aren't provided if they're being used for social outings only. So it's about presenting a really, really good case here. And again, wheelchair, assess wheelchair assessors are usually occupational therapists or physiotherapists. Um, OK, specialist kit. So that's things that are beyond standard. So standards are high back chairs, uh, shower commodes, um, small bits of kit available through statutory services. If they could become pretty technical, 
like the stuff that Kirsty has been showing you, the specialist seating, they will come via funds um, from whoever funds the individual. So if the individual is funded via social services, it's about exploring it through that. Or if not, they might be funded through health, what's called continuing healthcare, and they should be funded through that route. Um, it's not always that clear cut, and it's about finding out, usually through your occupational therapist, who funds the individual. Um, I'm a firm believer, again, that if you have a health condition such as Huntington's disease, you should not be funding these bits of specialist kit yourself because they're usually thousands and thousands of pounds. If it's due to a health need, there is a way usually, um, but it's pretty tricky even for us. Um, if you uh, have continuing health care and you've taken what's called a personal health budget, that might mean that you've been given a block of money. Do check out what that means in terms of equipment provision and maintenance of equipment. Yeah, so here we go. What have I written next? Oh, OK, this is about nursing homes. OK, so nursing homes usually have a contract with the local equipment providers, which is usually through the local authority or county council. So all of them have to provide the basics, such as profiling beds, um, armchairs, shower commodes, um, slings, hoists, all of those kinds of things thereafter okay if specialist equipment is needed within the nursing home and the assessment has been made whether it's through an in-house staff member such as a manual handling trainer or um, an occupational therapist or a physiotherapist if they're employed and the kit is needed for function uh, risk or health they should refer to a local ot for assessment and therefore go through that process. Who is funding this individual? Um, and I've said here that there's a set procedure to follow, which may include, depending on capacity, um, um, capacity is the ability for a person to understand what's going on. There might be a need for a best interest decision meeting. There may be a need for a review of care, okay, by whoever is funding the placement, um, or if it's self-funded, then a new review by social services needs to happen. Um, and so the process goes on. So it's very sort of structured and they need to work their way through that. If the assessment is clear and funding is clear, then the OT can provide a report or quote to funders, such as continuing healthcare. If it's a health need and it's not meeting other criteria, the OT can apply to the clinical commissioners or what's called the health board, for an individual funding request, okay? And they have to make a special case, but they have to have gone through all of the other bits before they get there first. Now, with specialist placements, such as places that Kirsty works, um, there should be an in-house therapy assessment via the placement funding, whether that's continuing healthcare or whether that's 117 aftercare. That's the bit that people get if they've been sectioned in hospital and therefore they should be entitled to their care being paid for by the state and it's called 117 but just as anywhere if it's if you're lacking if the person is lacking capacity um, a best interest decision will need to be made alongside of that application okay yep here we go this is reinforcing what i'm saying nursing homes have a contract as to what they should supply if in doubt, go to this very handy guide on the Royal College of OT's website, um, and that will give you some clarity as to this process. Um, OK, nursing homes and wheelchairs. OK, this depends on local criteria. So in the area that I work, um, certainly in Birmingham, um, the uh, uh, wheelchair services will provide um, wheelchairs to people in nursing homes um, provided they've met criteria for that so it's not just for social use only um, in some places if a person enters the nursing home with a wheelchair then wheelchair services will continue to be involved as their needs deteriorate so in other words provide a new wheelchair but in some places if a person enters the home and 
doesn't have a wheelchair, wheelchair services may actually say, turn around to the nursing home and say, actually, this is your responsibility. And in some areas it might be. So it's about knowing what all of the criteria is in your local area. OK, I don't think there was anything else on funding, was there? No, that's lovely. And actually, um, and it's, it's perfect timing as well. Oh, wow. OK. Yes. So our last slide was simply thank you all. Oh, yeah. Thank you okay. very much, to you, Alex and Kirsty. That was a very insightful webinar, and I hope it's been very useful for all those listening. Um, and please do check out our other webinars in this series, either live or on our website. Thank you all for attending, and thanks again to Alex and Kirsty. Take care, all. <laughs>